Hi everybody, welcome to session 3.6 where we talk about grants. From this class session, I want you to understand the nature of the private grant making economy. We're going to talk about some practical advice for grant seeking and then describe some unique challenges that relate to government grants specifically. The grant economy in the United States, and we're talking about the private grant economy, meaning foundations primarily, has some really fascinating features to it. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of grant making foundations, around 76,000 of them in the U.S. These numbers, by the way, are a few years old, but still pretty close to accurate for today. Um, in the year that uh, I collected this, the total amount that was given through grants by foundations was $45.7 billion. It tends to be about that amount. It ticks up as the economy does better and it shrinks dramatically as the economy does worse. I'll show you evidence of that in just a minute. Um, but, uh, you know, that's a lot of money that's available to nonprofits as a result of, uh, this kind of philanthropy where it gets really interesting is when you look at where the money comes from within the grant economy, the top 25 funders, um, within this space give away $10.7 billion. So about a quarter of what's given out every year comes from just 25 foundations That's 25 out of, out of the 76,000. So what you can see is that this is really, really top heavy as far as grant making is concerned. And it's not top heavy just by where the money's coming from, but the size of the grants that are given out. If you look at grants given out in chunks of $5 million or more, um, it's 22 billion. So it's about half. Now this has some important implications. It means that if you want grant money, you have to be persuasive to a small group of funders and you have to be able to justify very large grants. If you're a small nonprofit, for example, that can't justify a $5 million uh, grant from a foundation, then half of the money given out by foundations every year <clears throat> isn't even available to you. And so there's a really strong concentration of wealth um, within philanthropy. That wealth within philanthropy is largely held in invested assets, um, primarily like the stock market or bonds or things like that, the typical things you would expect for a savings account for a large organization. And this chart shows you how heavily their assets can change based on the uh, performance of the economy. So here you can see, you know, this, this chart starts with the dot-com bubble which burst and dropped valuations by about 10 to 15 percent. And then they climbed again up until the financial crisis. And there, there was a substantial drop of about 25 percent. Um, this is a huge amount of money lost as a result of uh, changes in the stock market. And this is how this plays out um, in the foundation space. And so foundations can actually be pretty volatile sources of revenue when there are large economic swings. Um, back to the concentration of wealth thing. This, I think, is one of the most revealing charts I've ever seen anybody do. And at first glance, it's not easy to digest, but I'll explain it here just in a minute. But you'll also notice this was collected in 2006, which means that it's pretty old, but um, it reflects what's still going on today within the foundation economy and the grant economy. That bar chart on the left shows you the number of foundations that have assets in each of those four categories. So the dark color means that they have $50 million or more in assets. And then the progressively lighter shades of gray reflect smaller amounts. And so what you can see is that 2% of the foundations that exist today have assets of 50 million or more. Now that reflects a concentration of wealth, but how important that is you see in the chart on the right, because on the right, what you can see is that when you, when you track assets owned by those uh, foundations and those sizes in those four categories of size, then you see how big that concentration of wealth is. What the, what the chart on the right means in combination with the chart on the left is that 2% of the foundations that exist today own 69% of the assets. Sorry, and this was back in 2006, but it's still about the same today, or at least I haven't seen anybody reproduce this chart, but we have every reason to think it's the same. And so 2% of foundations controlling about 70% of the assets shows you how powerful a small group of funders are within the grant economy. There's also 
a strong uh, geographic uh, bias. And what you can see is that although foundations have grown in their geographic distribution gradually over time, you can see the largest concentrations of foundations are primarily in urban centers. Um, and so the exception to that being uh, uh, Texas and Florida, but pretty much everywhere else you can see there are large cities affiliated with where these foundations are located. A question we're going to discuss together in class is what the proper role of philanthropy is. And I gave you a really compelling reading, I think, that covers a lot of the different uh, perspectives on this. But it's something I want us to discuss together. Like, what is the right role of philanthropy? It's it's uh, largely unaccountable money. I mean, it's it, it's, it's, it has high accountability as far as tax reporting is concerned, but as long as they're operating, you know, within pretty wide set of boundaries, um, there's not much control that the government has over where this money goes. And uh, the question is, are we comfortable with what this money does? Um, there are villains on both sides of philanthropy, depending on your political perspective. So on the if you if you are if you lean left politically, then you've heard lots of criticisms about the Koch brothers. If you lean right politically, you've heard lots of criticisms about George Soros. Um, these are people who have wielded quite a bit of influence politically and otherwise through their philanthropy. Anyway, these are questions we're going to discuss together, and it, I hope it uh, makes for an interesting conversation. Just some practical details to consider. If you're seeking grants, um, the, one of the most important things to know is that if you know somebody at the foundation that's giving money, it dramatically increases the likelihood of receiving a grant. I can't stress this enough. I've seen it firsthand many, many times. So it's really important that you network, that you find ways to connect with people that either know or work with foundations directly. So that way you can have an in. Most foundations receive far more applications than they can process. And so they can pull out those uh, applications that are uh, submitted by people that they have a relationship with. There is a, a, a kind of philanthropy going on called venture philanthropy. And um, this is putting much more pressure on nonprofits to use impact assessment tools and to set measurable goals. Um, philanthropy is pushing more impact measurement out of nonprofits, which is a good thing. So be ready for more of that as this trend continues. And you need to be familiar with the reality that the grant writing process has a lot of particularities, a lot of idiosyncrasies that depend on the funder. A funder, for example, may specify a font size or, or, or margin size in the applications that they receive, or they may require that you only submit an application through their online portal. It can be any number of things like that. If you don't follow all of these rules, that the funder has set forth, then they will throw your application out without even considering it. It sort of serves as a filtering mechanism. And if you remind me, I'll tell you a story in class about brown M&Ms that relates to this idea. It's a story some of you may already know. But anyway, um, so it's also good to know how grant, how grant makers receive applications. Um, they tend to happen in these three categories. There are, again, a lot of individual differences from one foundation to the next, but largely you can see that foundations either receive an open application process, meaning they just have a standing invitation to submit proposals. That's much more common with smaller foundations. Um, larger foundations issue RFPs or requests for proposals. This is where they're trying to target a specific thing. The Gates Foundation, for example, does this, so they might have a a target in sanitation to make sure that X number of people get improved sanitation over the next three years, and they will issue a request for proposals that meet the, where the proposals are designed to meet that goal. And then a, a, another a process that a lot of foundations use are LOIs or letters of inquiry. And this is where they say, don't send us a whole proposal, just send us a one to two page letter. And we will let you know, based on reading that letter, if what you do is something that's interesting enough to us that we want a more full proposal. So if you hear back on an LOI, it doesn't mean you got a yes. It means that they are telling you that they're willing to hear more. LOIs are a great process for foundations that don't have a lot of staff because they simplify the amount of work required to screen uh, potential uh, recipients of money. And they also uh, save the time of all the people who are applying. Let's talk briefly about government grants. Uh, 
And this is an important conversation because a lot of people uh, get the impression that government grants are easy money. You might even see advertising that makes that promise. Um, that's not usually true at all. Government grants are usually identified by very strict application requirements. And then if you get the grant, they're very detailed reporting requirements. We'll talk about this more in class, and some of you may have firsthand experience with this. But government grants are paperwork heavy. Um, another thing is that they require special financial accounting where you account per grant on all the costs associated with the grant so that you're not commingling. Most government grants require partitioning of resources that way, so that way you can account for the way the money that you received in the grant and, and show and prove that it was spent just on the, the purpose of the grant. And then one other thing that makes it really hard is a lot of grants are a lot of government grants are either reimbursable or matching, which means that the, the nonprofit has to put forward the financial resources first before they start getting money from the government. And this uh, puts increases the financial burden on nonprofits who rely on government grants. So it's very rare that you can just operate a nonprofit um, 100% on government grants. Usually you have to have some other funding source to get started. If you decide after those warnings that you still want to seek government grants, most federal grants, oh, sorry, all federal grants are processed through grants.gov. So that's the best place to start if you're seeking government grants. I'll also say that U.S. senators and, rep and representatives can be a resource to you in helping uh, uh, obtain government grants. Usually a letter from a senator or from a U.S. representative can have some sway, and they can also bring grant opportunities to your attention. Sometimes uh, government grants have really quick turnaround from the time they're announced to the time they're re awarded, sometimes measured in just four or five months. And so that's another way that a relationship with a, a senator or representative can be helpful to you. Anyway, so that's it. We're going to have a deeper discussion together in class, but that's uh, all we have for this. So I will see you next time.